So why do we hold on oh, even when we want to let go? And what do we do about it? Particularly from a Kriya Yoga mystical inward meditative uh, framework. So think about this. Right now we're actually doing this. We're going through old photos because uh, our kids are visiting and we're looking at old photos. And every time a photo comes up, you know what happens. It triggers memories, some overlapping, but often <clears throat> unique to each individual, the memory and the meaning of that memory. This happens for all of us. If we were involved, if that photograph reflects us or something that's important to us, it opens up memory tracks. By contrast, when we were cleaning out um, the property that had been in the family for hundreds of years uh, for Davy's family, when we were cleaning out some of the barns and workshops that had been built on the property, filled, filled, filled over the generations uh, of the accumulation, we'd pick up something, a record, we'd pick up an artifact, and I would pick it up and for me it had no memory tracks associated with it. It was just the thing and so it was easy for me to let go of. But other people who were their uh, family members would say, that belonged to Uncle John and Aunt Ruth and they would have an entire uh, connection through those memory tracks and it was hard for them to accept the act of letting it go. So these memory tracks are a key to our whole process of letting go. The memory tracks are both states of consciousness and embodied structures in our subtle body, particularly in our, definitely in our nervous system gets activated, but these structures of memory are linked to the chakras, to the subtle body. They're a system of states and structures. And like every system, the memory track wants to continue to live and it needs to be fed. And how are the memory tracks fed? They are fed by our attention. Attention is food. It's just like when a child is acting out in a particular way, parents and others will know they need attention. They need attention because they, their nervous system and their subtle body has become dysregulated and they need the energy and the presence of that witnessing awareness from the caregiver to rebalance. And it's much the same in our own inner world. Now the yogis understood and understand that where attention goes, the prana flows. Attention is the psychological aspect of this energy that we're feeding. And prana is the purely energetic aspect. And they move together. There's kind of an intelligence, there's a better word for the, for the psychological aspect of the attention and the prana. Uh, is the energetic side, and they move together. Where the attention goes, the prana flows. And the prana is that which feeds and vivifies the memory tracks. The memory tracks, remember, are our inner pets, our inner patterns, our inner emotions, our inner thoughts, linked to memories of people, events, and things that we feed with our attention. In a positive sense, of course, <clears throat> the idea of feeding memory tracks can be a way of cultivating certain qualities that we want to bring to life and strengthen. So reading spiritual texts, attending programs, reflecting on um, the meaning of life and events. These are ways of bringing awareness and energy to memory tracks that are linked with our awakening process. Now, 
there's also an external dimension to this, which is that the principle of spending time, keeping the company, the satsang, the sangha, keeping company with people, attending events, having things like statues and mandalas and such, whatever, that strengthen the memory tracks of awakening. Spiritual community sangha is a key in all traditions around the world, coming together with practicing ones, whether it's chanting, meditating, dancing, coming together with like-minded souls who practice the disciplines that feed the memory tracks of awakening, of bliss, of loving awareness, of compassion, and of wisdom. This is an important part of our practice. Yes, you know, in uh, coaching circles, business coaching circles, there's often suggested to new young entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, they don't have to be young, to spend time with, to keep company with people who are a bit further along on that entrepreneurial path because it feeds the memory tracks that support the identity of business success. The same thing applies in any discipline. The memory tracks, remember, do not have to be about people and events and things in the so-called past because our conventional idea of memory is very conditioned and very contracted like our idea of time is very conditioned and contracted. Plato said all learning is remembering and that is to suggest that within the soul of your being, dormant perhaps, are those memory tracks of awakening, of bliss, of loving awareness. And they can be reawakened, revivified through spiritual practice, through spiritual company. You can place symbolically your attention and feed energy to the so-called future self. You are the future Buddha and you can vivify that memory track. You can be in relationship to it. You can recognize that the self that you inhabit currently is really a habit of mind, like of conditioning. Shelley said it's important to remember the future, stretching our concept of remembrance to transcend our normal way of experiencing and time and feeding the memory tracks of our aspirations, which are already present within us. Shifting to decluttering, getting rid of the photographs or getting rid of the candlesticks or the old cars in the, that are parked all over the property. We'll use the example of a candle holder that we found hand wrought iron candle holder, ancient, beautiful. Should we get rid of it or keep it? It's not the candle holder that's holding us. It's the memory tracks, the memory tracks that are unconsciously linked to the candle holder and that require, those memory tracks require, in quotes, the candle holder and all the associated stories and family karma to be remembered and remembered and remembered to be fed. Everything, everything, whether it's a person, event, or a thing in our life, in our, in our inner world, outer world, is both a straightforward thing. It's like the candle holder. It's just a candle holder. And it's also a symbol, a symbolic multi-level activator of memory tracks. And these memory tracks, the feeding of these memory tracks is what uh, embeds us in a self-concept and in a world of experiences that are circumscribed and defined by those conditioned memory tracks. Now, when my mother, years, decades ago, was uh, alive, 
at one and had a, she was a challenging personality for many people. Davy wrote her a letter talking about how to improve their relationship. And it was a beautiful letter of vulnerable and an invitation. And Rosalind, for her, it was like, oh, a stab to the heart. Because the conditioned self was like, how could I do anything wrong? I have to die in some way to become a new kind of person relating, interacting in a different way. And here's the key. She used to, she told us, bless her for this teaching. She used to carry the letter in her purse and at various times in the day, she would take it out and reread it. She would give it attention and it would revivify the suffering, the pain and the identity structure that allowed her to continue to live in the ways that fed and supported those memory tracks. Here's the key point. When we are identified with a memory track, we aren't remembering it clearly. We're not seeing the memory track. We're not witnessing the memory track. We're seeing through the memory track. And so the people and events and things that we're remembering are being filtered through the perspective of that unconscious unwitnessed memory track, which is designed as a pattern of loyalties and prejudices that has sometimes been called a false self. We could call it a conditioned self system, one that we take to be, because we're not witnessing it, our true self. When we are identified with the memory tracks, our witness awareness is degraded as we are identifying with the self image that is embedded in and woven of those memory tracks. We're not remembering, we're replaying. That's what the Roslyn story is. We're replaying and feeding the patterns, the emotions, the thoughts, the inner narrative that keeps us circling around and around in a repetitive, redundant, orbit. We're vivifying and revivifying the conditioned self, the identity that is unwitnessed and unliberated. So the spiritual path in many ways is the path of expanding, as our teacher Goswami Kriyananda says, expanding the horizon of awareness and of awakening to a new center around which all the memory tracks, all the sub-personalities, all the inner people, events and things that still are there, we don't forget, but they are now circling around a new inner center, like the Buddha at the center of the mandala. Remember the poem by Rilke that goes like this. I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. I may not complete this last one, but I give myself to it. I circle around God, the, around the primordial tower, and I have been circling for thousands of years. And still I don't know, am I a falcon, a storm? or a great song. Or this is the shift from circling around the conditioned identity, which creates a fixed orbit to placing the Ishtar, placing the divine, placing the essence at the center, the primordial tower that allows us to expand and expand the horizon. Instead of circling in the conditioned, around the conditioned memory determined self, who inhabits a memory determined world. We expand and expand and transcend and including the memories that were once identified with unconsciously, we heal them and we let them go so they can join in the song and the awakening. Now, 